My name is Peter Bull. I'm one of the co-founders of Driven Data. Uh, and our mission is to bring the power of data science to the social sector. So we work with nonprofits, NGOs, and public sector groups to get the most out of their data. So this talk is really going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be the state of data use in the social sector and the problems that are there, which are unique to that industry. Uh, and then the second part is going to be sort of a technical talk about some of the things we learned from our competitions and some tips and tricks for machine learning. So I'm trying to hit both audiences there. Um, to give you a little bit of background about myself, uh, I have a degree in philosophy and a degree in computational science. Uh, and I worked at Microsoft for a number of years and got sort of more and more involved in data projects while I was there. Uh, and ended up feeling like I wanted to apply the skills I was learning to problems that are the social value. So hence driven data. So I'm going to start with sort of an overview of what the social sector looks like and how they're using their data. And the first thing I want to show is the potential. So this is a video that is drone imagery from a cyclone that hit Vanuatu. And we want to live in a world where we can use data like this to map, quantify damage, help relief organizations to optimize their resource allocation and distribution across these kinds of disasters where they have to be acting really quickly. So if I'm a disaster relief organization, I collect uh, data from natural disasters, I collect uh, resource data, I collect videos, I have images, I have text reports from the field, uh, and what do I do with those kinds of things? So you folks in the audience are a lot of you data scientists, so I want to ask you, if you had that kind of data, what would you do with it? I'm literally asking you, if you have any ideas, like you've got resource data, you've got these images, you've got text reports, what are some things you might try? Make what? So like optimize your planning? Sure. Find hotspots? Yeah, that's great. Classification of like... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so sort of predicting how much of a certain resource an area might need? Sure. Connect resources and needs, a sort of an optimization problem, yeah. Yeah, so planning for the future, so learning from those disasters. That's great. Um, so those are some good ideas. And I want to talk about what actually gets done. And they use some pretty advanced methods. I think you guys might have heard of some of these. Um, one of them is called counts. They, they count things. Uh, another one is called sums, which is like counts, but not the same. Uh, and something even more advanced is called averages. So you throw that in the mix as well. And one of the problems is that there's what we've been calling a data literacy gap, where when it comes to data science, nonprofits don't know what they don't know. They don't know the kinds of things that you came up with just off the top of your head without my even describing any real data, right? But if you're looking at a real data set, you can get real ideas about how to use that to improve your operations. And so nonprofits don't have the staff that can turn that data into those kinds of problems that can be tackled with data science methods. So there are a couple ways that we think we can approach the data literacy gap. It's really an education problem, so it's not an easy problem to solve. But there are a couple ways to attack it. Um, one is running and publicizing projects with organizations. Uh, and this is happening actually across the data science community. There's been a growth of data science for social good organizations, and I'll give you the names of some later. Um, another is formal education resources and training so that the staff at these organizations 
can develop the skills and use the tools that you all do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the third thing is encouraging data scientists to work in the social sector. So showing folks like yourselves that there are really fascinating problems and really interesting data challenges in the social sector. You can go work for these organizations and you can have a very fulfilling job where you're working on really hard, interesting problems. So that's the, the first problem in the social sector is that there's a data literacy gap. Um, but we all know that we have the computational methods, uh, we have the tools, uh, we have the computational power to solve a lot of these problems. But what the organizations don't have is the data scientists. And some people have gone so far as to call data scientists unicorns. Uh, but they're not, they're not really unicorns because unicorns aren't real. They're more like people wearing unicorn masks and that they're very, very rare. So that's the data capacity gap in that even if they knew what they could do with their data, they don't have the folks and in-house resources to take advantage of that. So this is a chart you all will like. It's the growth of data science jobs. Uh, and McKinsey estimates that there will be 190,000 unfilled analytics positions in 2018. So that's a huge gap in the commercial sector and the social sector is gonna lag even further behind. So does anyone know what the average salary of a data scientist is? Yeah, it's about 100,000, almost 120. 118 is what one of the surveys I saw recently said. Uh, does anyone know what the average salary of the executive director of a nonprofit with a budget in that range is? The executive director. <laughs> you guys are pretty cynical. I heard some like 40Ks out there. Uh, it's more than that, but it's not a lot. It's $133,000. So how many data scientists do you think these organizations are gonna be able to hire? Zero. Approximately zero. <laughs> <laughs> so the state of the world is sort of, we've got these kinds of organizations, but they're blocked by two things. They have a literacy problem and they've got a capacity problem. And that's stopping them from getting analytics that they can use. However, this is a really high value space to be working in. It's so early, but everything is moving that way. The whole social sector is lagging behind the commercial sector by 10 or 15 years, but data is coming to them. They're starting to collect more and more data and they want to be using it in smart ways. So it's a great time to be working on it. And the opportunities is, so this quote is from uh, UN OCHA, which is their humanitarian aid organization, uh, just saying that the opportunity for big data in the humanitarian space is enormous. So now I'm gonna sort of walk through what we're working on at Driven Data uh, and sort of how we think we fit into approaching this problem and also then a case study of one of the competitions that we've run. So here's a picture of my Netflix queue. Uh, as you guys know, Netflix has gotten pretty good at knowing what kinds of movies you might want to watch. Uh, and one of the ways in which they did that was they ran an online competition. And in 2006, they offered a million dollars to anyone who could improve their recommendation engine by 10%. And in 2009, a team won this and they took some of the learnings from that competition and implemented them so they can tell me that I wanna watch movies that have cool mustaches in them. Um, so how does a competition like this work? I think this is a pretty technical audience, so uh, I'm not going to dive too deeply into this slide. Uh, this is basically explaining the split between training data and test data. Raise your hand if you know what that is. All right, so we're just, we're just gonna breeze right through this. We got a training set, we have our test set. We withhold the answers from the test set. People predict them. We compare them against what actually happened, give them a score, right? <clears throat> so we're gonna get into the more interesting piece, which is this case study of a nonprofit that we worked with. So the name of the nonprofit is Education Resource Strategies. And they take school budgets from districts and individual schools, and they help those schools advise, they advise those schools on how to use those resources 
in smarter ways. And so they have a history of helping schools correlate their resource spending with student outcomes, which in the United States haven't been correlated for approximately 50 years. Um, and part of the problem is that there are no benchmarking standards for schools and school districts. So they don't report their spending in uniform ways, which means that this nonprofit has to work with raw budget data. So they get budgets that look like this, and they get budgets that look like this, and some look like that, some look like this, and they need to decide what to do with those kinds of budgets. So I want to make this problem really real for you guys and show you some actual data. Uh, so this is some of their data. And actually, the stuff in green is the labels that they attach. So they look at each of those line items and attach nine labels to each one. So that's that, that green side. Uh, and then that white side extends for like another 10 or 15 columns. But I'm going to pull out some examples here. Uh, and I want you to raise your hand if you think you could categorize this by reading it. This is what people were doing manually. Think you could categorize PetroVend fuel and fluids, regional playoff hosts, capital assets locally defined groupings, furniture and fixtures, maint materials. Like some of these you might know, but there are some abbreviations in there. There's some weird punctuation in there. Item GH extended day is probably useful to someone. Water and sewage star. <laughs> Instructional materials. Upper early intervention program. Uh, if anyone knows what upper early is, please tell me after this talk. Food services, other costs, non-capitalized AV, and sub period dash space materials. So they get data like that, and they get a row like this. Uh, and they want to attach labels to that row that explain where the money came from and what it was used for. Uh, and they've been doing it by hand, but we want to give them predictions that tell them which labels are the most likely. So we want to start with those, but that budget data and run it through a magical algorithm so they get some predictions. And instead of looking like that, they look like this. So one of the ways in which we approached this problem was to run an online data science competition where we put that budget data up and we put those labels up and we asked data scientists around the world to compete to come up with the best algorithm to attach those labels to those budget line items. And uh, I'm going to show you the equation for the method that the winning data scientists used. Uh, and if you know what that method is, I want you to shout it out. Logistic regression, there it is. The, the winning algorithm, the model was logistic regression. It wasn't a complicated algorithm. But for this problem, as you saw from that text data, the solution is all about the features. So this is the person that won. He submitted 100 times. You can submit three times a day. And so I'm pretty sure he was not working at his full-time job and was just doing this. So this is where it gets a little technical. I'm going to show you how uh, he wrote all of his code from scratch, but all of the tips and tricks he used are built into libraries that you can use really easily. So the most important insights that he got in manipulating the features in this data, you can do in about one line in scikit-learn. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So this is a basic approach to getting features from text in scikit-learn. Uh, and what this little piece of code does is it takes text data and it gives you what's called a bag of words. So it looks at every word that appears across all of the data and then counts how many times that word appears in a particular row. So the first insight that this data scientist had was that uh, because the data was so non-standard, you should tokenize on punctuation, not just white space. And so that means that when you're looking at a word and you have something like petroven fuel and fluids, you could split it up this way on white space, and that's the default in a lot of libraries. But he also split it on punctuation. And so this is really easy to do in scikit-learn. Um, 
when I said that it could be done in one line, that's like one line from a normal distribution with a variance of one. So it's approximately one line. Uh, so here I just define a method that I want to split the text on, and then I pass it as the tokenizer to that count vectorizer. So this just splits on uh, anything that's not an alphanumeric character, or actually just an alphabetic character here. Anything that's not an alphabetic character, split on that. The next thing he did was include bigrams and trigrams in his model. And so he didn't just look at a bag of words where we have petroven, fuel, and fluids as features. And those are called unigrams or onegrams. But he also looked at features for words that appeared next to each other. So those are bigrams. And then he did it for three words in a row. And those are called trigrams. This is even easier to do in scikit-learn by just adding that one parameter, n-gram range. And we start at unigrams, and we include up to trigrams. So I'm, I'm showing you how to do a winning NLP model right here. So you might want to take notes if you're interested in data science competitions, because I could tell you about another NLP one that's going on right now that you might be interested in. So the third thing he did was a computational trick. So he had two sort of pre-processing tricks. He also had a computational trick and a statistical trick. And it was the union of those three different kinds of tricks that helped him win this competition. And so this is called the hashing trick. And uh, you can imagine that if I look at all the words that I see appear in this text, I'm going to get this huge matrix. Right? If each column is an individual word that I see, it's going to get enormous. It's going to be very hard to perform computations on it. So the hashing trick says, I'm going to take each of those words, and I'm going to run it through a hash function that generates an integer. And then I'm going to put whatever that word hashes into, I'm going to put it into that column instead. But I'm going to constrain that hash space. So I'm going to say the maximum size of my matrix can be 2 to the 18, or something like that. And it's OK if sometimes words hash to the same thing. And we'll get approximately the same result. But we can save a lot of computation time by decreasing the size of our matrices. So this is also really easy to do in scikit-learn. Instead of using the count vectorizer we had earlier, we just replaced that with the hashing vectorizer. It's all built in there for you. The statistical trick that he used uh, is called interaction terms. So if we look at this formula we had for logistic regression, and we zoom in a little bit on that e to the negative beta x term, we zoom in a little bit more, and that, that beta x term is a linear combination of the feature values, so those counts of words that we saw, that's the x1 and x2 and a set of coefficients that say how important seeing that word is to the particular prediction we're looking at. And what interactions do is instead of just looking at how important it is to see one word independently, we look at how important is it to see two words together. We look at all the different pairwise interactions that we can have, so we add this coefficients for the multiplication of two of those features. Uh, and this is, this is why I said it's normally distributed around one line of code, because this is a little bit more code, but it's also super easy in scikit-learn. You can add interaction terms just by using this polynomial features preprocessing code from the library. So we take uh, what we had before and we create a hashed matrix of those alphanumeric tokens that uh, have both the one gram to three gram words in them. Uh, and then we transform that text into that matrix. And then on that matrix that we have, we run it through this polynomial features object, which, because I've set it to degree two, is doing those pairwise interactions. Uh, and then the matrix we get out of that is our final set of data, 
And then he just ran logistic regression on that for each of the different labels that you could have. So this is, I don't know, 10 lines of code. That's uh, approximately what the winner of this competition did. And so for something where your data is complex, it's really the feature engineering that matters and not the method that you're using. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, just another example uh, of a different competition we ran that's a very different kind of data set. So what you're looking at is the count of different kinds of variables in this data set. So that blue bar that's really tall is categorical variables. Um, so those are things like yes, no answers. Uh, and the green one is ordinal variables. So for this data set, those are actually mostly years that go in some order. Uh, and then the orange one, which is smaller, is your numeric variables. So this is harder to create models around because there are tons of NANs in this data set. This data set comes from a survey and the survey branches. So if you're not, if you answer no to a particular question, you may not answer another set of questions. And so those show up as NANs in your data. Uh, and what this histogram is showing is that uh, the count of NANs uh, that is near 1,000, so all the way on the left side of that graph, we have almost, almost 1,000 columns that have that many NANs in them. And just to visualize this another way, this is the data set if you just plot each cell uh, as a pixel, and the green ones are NANs, and the yellow ones are not NANs. So this is a tricky data set to work with. You have to figure out how to fill those NANs with data so that your mathematical models can work. And so people used relatively simple techniques for filling the NANs, uh, and then used more sophisticated models, because this is a data set where there's not a lot of feature engineering you can do. And so they had to get more power out of the models that they were using. And so if you're not building features, one approach is to build ensembles. So the first place solution in this competition, uh, he used 11 models uh, and then simply averaged them together. He did a little bit of feature engineering as he mentions here. Uh, and for all of the features, he considered zero as an NA or a null level. And so it was just a pretty simple strategy for filling those in. Uh, and then it was the power of combining different models which were good at selecting different rows for those predictions. And the second place solution used something called stacking, which did anyone go to Owen's talk earlier today? Yeah, a couple of people. So Owen talked about uh, some sophisticated methods of stacking. Um, and I would definitely recommend trying the ones that he was talking about. This person trained six models on his first level. And then he took the predictions that those models outputted and trained five more models on that. And then averaged those together to get his final predictions. And that's how he got second place. Uh, and I want to caution you against this because when we verified this solution, it took us 30 hours to train his models on EC2. It was a nightmare. So please don't do that to me. <laughs> so you may be asking, what can I do now? So this is a map of Boston. And those dots that you're seeing are hygiene violations in restaurants. So. Boston sends public health inspectors to restaurants around the city. And those public health inspectors look for things like food that's not at the right temperature. They look for people who are not wearing gloves. They look for people who don't wash their hands. Uh, and they categorize those kinds of violations into three levels of severity. Uh, and then restaurants get fined based on how many violations they have. So, Right now, Boston essentially sends these inspectors out at random. They have about 20 inspectors. And on any given day, they sort of use their intuition for the restaurants that they want to visit. And they're interested in seeing if they can be more effective in using those resources. They want to be visiting the restaurants that are most likely to have violations. 
So we're running a competition right now where we've got this historical hygiene inspection data from Boston, but we also have restaurant reviews from Yelp. And we want to see if you all can find the words, the phrases, uh, the patterns in the price of the restaurants, the kind of cuisine it is that help those restaurant inspectors to find the places that are most likely to have violations. So it's this huge sort of natural language processing data set to help the city of Boston improve the way that they're doing their inspections. So this competition, uh, the submissions for the first phase close on July 7th. Uh, and what you need to do by July 7th is predict how many inspections inspectors, or sorry, how many violations inspectors are going to see at any given restaurant if they go and visit it in the next six weeks. And so we're going to award prizes to the people that are most effective at predicting those actual inspections that the inspectors do in the, the six weeks that follow the competition. We also have a handful of other competitions going on right now that are just for fun. So those three along the bottom don't have monetary prizes, but they may be interesting data sets. Uh, and I mention them because they vary in the level of complexity. So if you're starting as a data scientist, there's a blood donation competition that's a binary classification problem. It's relatively simple. It's a pretty small data set, but it's a great way to get started thinking about how to attack a data problem. Then there's one where the goal is to predict whether or not water pumps uh, in Tanzania are functioning, whether they're functioning but they need some repairs, or whether or not they're completely broken. And so you have a multi-class classification problem. Uh, and then the third one is predicting the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. So these are things like the proportion of children that have primary education or the proportion of the population that lives under a dollar a day. And what the competition does is take a look at all of the macroeconomic indicators that the World Bank collects. So it has, uh, I think, around 2,000 variables for every country since around 1970. And so your goal is to take a look at those other time series and see if you can predict the values of the ones, the macroeconomic indicators that are the Millennium Development Goals using those other time series on both a one year and a five year time horizon. So I also wanted to mention uh, if competitions aren't your thing, uh, there are other ways to get involved in the data science for social good space and you should think about it. So DataKind has a, a chapter in New York, in DC, San Francisco, uh, I think Singapore and Bangalore. Uh, and they're a data science volunteer organization. So you can essentially be a pro bono consultant working with them. They're a great organization to work with. If you're a student, you should look at the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship, which is at the University of Chicago. Uh, and they bring you to Chicago for a summer. They pay you a stipend and you get to work on a Data Science for Good project. And then if you're a professional, you might also look at Bayes Impact, which has a sort of embedded fellow model, where it's like Code for America, where you go and work for one organization on their data problems for a longer period of time, like six months or a year. So these aren't your only opportunities. So another thing you can do is just find a nonprofit and volunteer. Uh, so I was talking with a really small nonprofit that uh, looks at water quality in one of the watersheds in the Boston area. And they have PhD students that are building predictive algorithms for them to predict the water quality based on the flow rate from sewers uh, and the weather. Um, so they've got a pretty cool project and it's a tiny, tiny nonprofit but they have really interesting data to work with. So you can also just go out, email organizations, and try to find a way to get involved. Another thing you can do that's uh, a little less of an investment is to just do a data analysis project on a data set that has some sort of social meaning. So you can look at 
data.gov, for example, and do some visualization, some exploratory analysis, some predictive modeling to help nonprofits who are working in particular issue areas understand what kinds of things they can be doing, right? So we're trying to attack that data literacy problem by demonstrating to different organizations the kinds of things that their data can be used for. Uh, so that's all I've got for my talk. Um, let's see, we can do Q&A, uh, or the other thing we can do, I've got some demos of those competitions that I could run through if people are interested in that. All right, so raise your hand if you want to see a demo, or raise your hand if you'd rather have a convo. All right, so demo, convo. All right, we're going to do the demo then. Um, so now you have, actually I'm going to run this notebook because it's a little more interesting. Can you guys see this okay if we get down to the code? Yeah, we can do a cell at a time. Great. So this is an example of how you might tackle that Yelp problem that I was mentioning, looking at the restaurant reviews and coming up with a predictive model to see where hygiene violations are most likely. So the first thing we do is load in the data. So when you compete in the competition, you get the Yelp data. So this is the actual reviews themselves. This is the descriptions of the businesses. So it has things like their average star rating, uh, their price level, their hours that they're open. Uh, there's a data set called tips. And so these are like reviews, but they're like one sentence reviews. Like this is a great place for cheese sandwiches. Uh, and then you have check-in data from Yelp. So you can also get a sense of the foot traffic that a restaurant gets if you think that might be correlated with hygiene violations. Uh, and then data about the users. So if you want to be very careful and you want to tune your model based on a reviewer's particular tendency to be positive or negative, you can do that by looking at all of the reviews that a particular reviewer may leave. So if we look at, this is the first line from the Yelp data set. This is the first review that a restaurant has. Uh, and we can see that it's got information about how useful that review was. It's got the idea of the user that gave the review, the number of stars, the date of the review, and then a set of text that the reviewer left. That I'm sure you've all seen things like that on Yelp. So the other thing we have is we've got a mapping from uh, this ID in the Yelp data set to IDs in the Boston data set. So we just have to do a little data wrangling to match entities across those data sets. But we've gave, given you that mapping uh, already. So this cell, uh, I'm not going to stop on this cell, but it just loads in the data. Uh, and <clears throat> it drops some of the columns that this particular analysis doesn't use. So we end up with a relatively simple data frame for the reviews that's just the restaurant ID for the Boston data sets. We've dropped out those Yelp IDs and put the Boston ones in. It's got the date of the review. It's got the number of stars that the reviewer left and then all of the text of the review. And then the Boston data set has the date of the inspection. It's got the ID of the restaurant. And then it's got three sets of counts based on how severe a violation was. So three stars is a very severe violation, and one star is a minor violation. And your goal is to predict those three columns. So this is sort of a regression problem where you've got three different variables you want to do a regression on for each level of severity. And each row in the data set is an individual visit by an inspector. So any restaurant may have multiple inspections on different dates. And 
we can just take a quick look at the distributions of those violation counts. So we can see that uh, by and large, we see zero violations in the data set. Uh, and then the sort of minor violations, we see some humps around three or four. Uh, and then the more severe violations, we see fewer of. So as I mentioned, this is a natural language processing question. And so it's sort of like the one where I ran the example for the budgeting. Uh, and we're just going to go through a simple way of creating features from those restaurant reviews. So the first thing we do is flatten the reviews. Uh, and that just takes the data. And I'm just going to show you the output here. It concatenates all of the reviews for a restaurant uh, into a single string so that we can use the tools from scikit-learn, like the count vectorizer or the hashing vectorizer, to look at, for any given restaurant, the count of those particular words that we see. So we do that for the training set. Uh, and then we do that for the test set. And then we use something called the TFIDF vectorizer. So I mentioned the count vectorizer, which does your bag of words. I mentioned the hashing vectorizer, which does the hashing trick on a bag of words. Uh, and then there's something called a TFIDF vectorizer, which weights the importance of a word based on how often it appears in the entire data set. So words like the prepositions um, and other things that may be really common in restaurant reviews uh, are left out of, or are weighted as less important so that they're less likely to affect your predictive models. Uh, and we just sort of cap this at 1,500 features so that this takes a reasonable amount of time to train. So we take that text that we were looking at, which is, sorry, just to give you a better sense of what that does, uh, this looks at all of the restaurant reviews that occurred before a given date. So the date is when they were inspected. Uh, and so we just want to look at the reviews that happened before that inspection actually occurred. So once we fit that, we can take a look at what some of the features are. And we see that we've got a set of words that are our columns. And then we've got these TFIDF values, which are the occurrences weighted by how important that word is, essentially. And what we'll do, since this is a regression problem, is take your simplest regression method, uh, which is called ordinary least squares, which is just a linear model, and build one model for each of those violation levels. So in scikit-learn, the syntax to do that is you import linear model, and then you create a linear regression object that you fit on your training data. Uh, and that's your X matrix. So these are your, your set of features. Uh, and then your targets, which are the levels of the violations. So we have violations of one star, two star, and three stars. And we want to train a linear model for each one of those. So if you do that, you get this sort of boring output. Uh, and to make things a little more interesting, we looked at the features that were more or less likely to have violations associated with them. Um, and we found that for this particular simple model where we just looked at unigrams and there's probably a lot of multicollinearity and other problems, and so this is not entirely trustworthy and not something I would write up in a scientific paper, but it may be interesting to take a look at nonetheless. You see that places with fewer violations are correlated with words like pleasant, spectacular, people are talking about the lighting, uh, and places with more violations are described as strange or rushed. Uh, peppers and butter appear to be particularly dangerous. Uh, so you guys might want to check out menus beforehand and, and not eat those dishes. 
Um, and then the final thing we do is we write out the predictions for the test set. Uh, and so in what are three lines of scikit-learn code, we use that linear model to predict the test set that we left out that we don't have values for. We write it into a CSV file, right, which just looks like this. And so on this date, at this restaurant, we expect to see five one-star violations and zero two-stars and zero three-stars. And if you just sort of inspect this visually, you can see that we've done a decent job of tracking that distribution of violations that we saw. So there were a lot more zeros in your two-star and your three-star, and then the average number of violations was around three or four for the one-star violation. So we see that our predictions are about in that range as well. So that's just a good visual inspection to make sure that you're not doing anything crazy. And then if you submit that on driven data, you get a score of 1.13, which we'll go see where that puts us on the leaderboard right now. So that puts us in like, what is that? Like seventh or eighth place is that linear regression benchmark that we just looked at. So that's pretty decent. So that may be a good way to get started and see if you can improve your score to beat the people that are topping that on the leaderboard. All right, now I think I've got some time for Q&A. So just going to scroll down. And you can check out drivendata.org if you're interested in getting involved that way, uh, or if you're interested in getting involved with those other organizations, uh, or just volunteering yourself, you should do that. There's a lot of potential for using data in the social sector to really help these kinds of organizations be more effective or more efficient.